All right, welcome everyone to the Zojo webinar. I am Paul Lefevre, the Zojo Developer Evangelist. And this week we're gonna be talking about arrays, dictionaries, and iterators. Kind of a continuation from last week's webinar where we started talking about data types. And this will be followed up with another webinar in July where I'll be covering the text, data type, and encodings. And that should kind of complete the overall uh, data type overview of new framework type things. So as usual, I'm going to go through some slides here at the beginning. Feel free to ask questions. And we're going to jump into Zojo. We'll look at some actual examples, usually also a popular time for people to ask questions. And we'll be done. Uh, you can expect this webinar to be made available online, probably later today or tomorrow. All right, so arrays, dictionaries, and iterators. These are all, well, not all of them. Uh, Arrays and dictionaries are the uh, primary ones, but they're data collection types. They're gonna contain data that's used by your application. And why would you wanna store data in your application? Well, this is data that you may use later, you may need to look up. Uh, it's just stuff that your app's gonna need, and every app has data that it needs to access at some point or another. And arrays and dictionaries are ways to organize this data. You certainly don't wanna have uh, 8 million global variables tracking things, and uh, collection types allow you to kind of consolidate all of that into one particular data type, variable property, or whatnot that can contain a bunch of things. So first we're gonna look at arrays, which are the simpler of the two, uh, and then we'll take a look at dictionaries. And, and specifically, we're gonna be looking at the dictionary class that's in the new Zojo framework. So let's start with arrays. What are arrays? Uh, they're simply a list of items. The important thing to remember is an array can be any type. Now we talked a bit about data types last, in the last webinar. And arrays of course can be things like integers and text and stuff like that, but they can be any type. So if you have your own class, you can have an array of your own class and that is incredibly useful. You can have an array of anything that is a type. So that's important uh, concept to remember. Sometimes people forget that and uh, and don't uh, and then they they end up doing something more complicated than they need to be. The other important thing to know about arrays is they always have an integer index and it is always zero based. So your arrays always start at position zero. You can't change that. You can't tell them to start at a different number. Uh, and it's always an integer index that is looking up the array. Uh, and you can't change that either. There can be no gaps in array, in an array. So if you've uh, created an array of a certain number of elements, you remove an element. Uh, there's not a hole in the middle of the array. The array just kind of shrinks down and now has one fewer uh, number of elements. So if I do uh, a statement here, I create an array names size 10 as text. Uh, the question is, how many elements are in that array? And the answer is 11, because it is zero base. So it's going to start with zero and then go all the way up to 10. So you can have 11 elements. You can also declare arrays, and we'll be talking about this a little bit more, without any sort of uh, size at all. So just essentially the empty parentheses here. Uh, you can also put minus one in parentheses if you want, if that's uh, clearer for you. But that means that the array is start, it's, you're declaring an array, but it has nothing in it. There's a section in the new documentation site, uh, which is being called the Zojo Dev Center. And uh, we'll start to use that name more and more. But uh, at the Zojo Dev Center, the arrays page covers array topics. So you'll be able to have a reference there to go back to. So why would you use arrays? Well, the first reason you would use arrays is because they're simple. Uh, you know, just a list of things. Uh, you put them in there, you can access them, you can loop through them, simple usage. You can preload them easily with data. Uh, you can uh, do some code like you see here where you can use the array uh, method to populate uh, an array with a bunch of initial values. This can be great to uh, you know, populate pop-up lists or, or short amounts of information. You can just quickly create an array that has all the stuff in it. Uh, it's pretty handy. 
Uh, you want to use arrays when the order is going to matter. So if you have things that the order is very important, an array is going to maintain that for you. So that's another reason why you might use them. Fixed length versus dynamic are the two types of arrays uh, where you specify the actual size of the array. Like I mentioned earlier, you give an actual number or you don't give it anything and you just add elements to the array in your code. So this would be a fixed size array uh, of 10. And even though they're fixed, you know, I, I probably shouldn't use the term fixed, but even though they have a set size when you're declaring them, you can still add uh, additional elements to it. Uh, so it's not like permanently fixed at that size or anything. But a common technique you see is to create what's here is an empty array and then just add what you need to the array uh, depending on what your code requires. So some array features, you can sort arrays, which is pretty handy. Uh, obviously, you can only sort arrays for things that are sortable, so that's going to be the simple types, uh, things like text, uh, number stuff, uh, things like that. You can't, if you have an array of classes, you can't actually sort that uh, because it wouldn't know how to sort it, but I'll show you some code for how you can easily uh, set up something so that you can sort uh, classes based on some particular value of the class. And that's done using the sort and the sort with methods. You can search arrays using the index of method to search for an array that has a particular value and it'll give you the position. You can randomize an array using the shuffle method and that'll just you know completely mix up everything that's in the array and give everything new index positions. And you can organize and manipulate the array using append, insert, pop, and remove. And Primarily, append is the one that you're going to use when you're adding things to an empty array. Uh, and that just adds, as its name suggests, new elements to the end of the array. Insert lets you put them in at specific positions. Remove lets you remove elements that are at specific positions. And pop is a very specialized uh, method that just essentially takes an element off the top of the array. So you can kind of use an array as a stack, but we're not really going to worry about that. That's a bit specialized. There are some other parts of Zojo that uh, take advantage of arrays as well. If you have some text, you can, uh, well, not if you have text, but you can use the split method to split a text string uh, into an array. So if you have a, a block of text that's, say, a comma delimited, you can use the split method on it, tell it the delimiter is a comma, and you'll get back an array with each of the elements. Uh, that can be very handy, uh, particularly when you're, you're getting data from another source. The reverse is join, which will take an array and join it into, uh, into text. So it'll take each element of the array and combine it into a single uh, text with all the elements in it, separated by a delimiter that you specify. Arrays allow you to use the for each uh, command in Zojo, uh, which we'll look at in a bit. But that is kind of a specialized version of a for loop that doesn't require a counter variable. Instead, it lets you have a uh, variable that is of the type of the array, and each iteration through the loop, you just get back the contents of what's in that particular uh, element of the array. It's a little shorter to write, a little handier to use, so it's pretty neat. And uh, I'll reiterate, any type is supported with an array. Uh, you don't have to stick with the simple data types. You can use any type that you happen to create, any class, Anything like that. Now, when you're working with arrays, one thing that can crop up if you're not careful is an out of bounds exception. And that is an exception that you're going to get if you try to access an element in the array that does not exist. So if, for example, you create an empty array and you try to access any element in it, you know, element five of an empty array, well, that's an out of bounds exception. If you create an array of size 10 and you try to access element 15, that's an out of bounds exception. Uh, so it's, those are the type of exceptions you get. So it's important to understand uh, why those are gonna occur because you're accessing an element that just doesn't exist. And we'll again look at some code for what can generate these things. And, you know, and there, 
you know, like anything else, you can catch these exceptions if they're the sort of things that your code could possibly uh, result in. All right, I'm going to talk about dictionaries now. And like I said, I'm going to talk about all these uh, kind of at the overview level here in the slides, and then we'll jump into Zojo and look at some example projects for each of them, kind of step through, through some code and see how things work, and that'll probably open up for a lot of questions. So dictionary is a class, and you can find it in the Dev Center at this page. And it is actually in the zojo.core namespace. And from uh, that page, uh, here's a description of it. It's an unordered mutable value store that is loosely typed. And uh, sorry, I left off key uh, value store that is loosely typed. So pretty much is, it's a container for anything, anything and everything. It's, it's and that's probably the best way to say it. You can put anything in it and you can pull it out wherever you want. And because it's a key value store, the key is how you look up what you've just stored in the dictionary. And the key can also be anything. Uh, it can be text, which is probably the most common thing, but it can be a number. It can literally be anything because it is an auto uh, data type. And the value can also be anything. It's also an auto data type, and you can stick in whatever you want into the value. It can be one of the simple data types. It can be your own class, it can be, uh, it could actually be an array, it can be whatever you want. Dictionaries are very, very fast for finding things. Uh, because of the way they work behind the scenes, they use something called a hash table. So the, the keys essentially are divided into buckets and it allows uh, things to be looked up quickly. Uh, and it's much quicker than having a gigantic array that is filled with a bazillion things that you kind of have to scan through every time to find what you're looking for. Whereas with a dictionary, because of the hash table, it can hash the key, kind of find where it needs to look up your particular thing much more quickly and find what it needs. And dictionaries uh, in the new framework can also optionally be case sensitive. The old framework dictionary uh, had no ability to be case sensitive, and that sometimes was a sticking point for the type of data that people needed to put in the dictionary. But now that's no longer an issue, and we'll look at how you can set that up. It's, not, yeah, it's pretty easy, actually. Uh, Justin is asking if there's any memory limitations for keys or values in dictionary. I'm not aware of any memory limitations. Certainly using gigantic key values probably isn't the most efficient thing because that'll probably affect the hashing algorithm. Um, and that probably would just be a bad design in general. But other than that, I'm not aware of any memory limitations other than the usual, you know, running out of memory in the computer kind of thing. Or running out of memory in a 32-bit address space if uh, you have a 32-bit app running on the computer. Edwin is asking if you can mix data types in the dictionary for key and value. And that's a good question. You absolutely can mix your data types. I don't recommend it because uh, that makes your code a little bit more complicated because you're always having to check uh, which type of something is in there. Uh, and that probably won't make for a design that you're going to like. I probably would not have a dictionary that has a bunch of different uh, types for keys, especially. Uh, it's possible you could find a good use for having values that are different types, like maybe if you're using a dictionary to store app preferences or something like that. Um, that would be more reasonable, but I would not be monkeying around with having a single dictionary that has keys that are all kinds of different types. That so You're probably going to regret that. And yeah, using uh, to get it case sensitive, there's a compare keys event handler that you can implement. All right, dictionary has some uh, features. Uh, there's a clone method that essentially uh, makes a shallow copy of the dictionary. So it does give you uh, an entirely new dictionary that you can manipulate and use how you want without affecting the original dictionary. Uh, shallow copy means that it's only going to copy simple data types. So if your dictionary is containing classes or things like that, those won't actually get copied. 
There's a has key method that allows you to check if a key exists in the dictionary. Uh, that's very handy uh, because if you do attempt to access a dictionary and uh, pull in, uh, you know, you specify a key value that's not actually in a dictionary, well, that's an exception. That's a key not found exception. So uh, often it's handy to check if the key exists before you attempt to retrieve its value. Related to that is the lookup method, which does a similar thing to has key, uh, but instead of uh, just telling you, yes, the, the key exists or not, it will uh, return a default value if the key doesn't exist, or it will return the actual value if the key does exist. And again, that can be very useful uh, depending on your particular situation. And you can uh, remove uh, individual elements from the dictionary, or you can entirely empty out the dictionary just by calling remove all. And as I mentioned, the key not found exception is the one you want to pay attention for when working with dictionaries uh, so that you don't accidentally try to retrieve a value for a key that was never in a dictionary in the first place. Uh, that's type of exception that, you know, that would be embarrassing if that just made it out to your regular app. Uh, Edwin is noting here that uh, he sometimes stores a dictionary inside a dictionary. And yes, absolutely, you can certainly do that. You can put a dictionary in a dictionary by having uh, the value of one dictionary uh, entry be an actual completely different dictionary. And that works because dictionary is a type, just like anything else. Now, related to dictionary is the new dictionary entry class. And this essentially is used with for each, and it allows you to loop through uh, the elements of the dictionary and get the keys and the values for each element. And you can read about that in the Zotra Dev Center. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but it's a, a nice, clean way to loop through the dictionary. <clears throat> Excuse me, the dictionary. Now let's talk a bit about iterators. Speaking of using for each, there are two interfaces in the Zodra.core namespace, iterator and iterable. In conjunction, these two interfaces allow you to use the for each command with any class, and particularly any of your own classes. Couple built-in classes use it already. Dictionary uses it, as uh, I just mentioned there with the dictionary entry uh, class. And it's also used by folder item in zojo.io. And of course, you can use this with any of your classes. So I'm gonna show you a couple examples of how you can use this to uh, use for each to iterate through list box and just text um, line by line. So it's pretty neat and uh, has a lot of, uh, a lot of, yeah, I'd say it's a lot of pretty neat uses. And you know, it's not like it's something you couldn't do other ways, but it does write, uh, make for some pretty uh, concise, clear, and easy to read code. All right, I think that is it for the slides. Yep, we're up to the Q&A. So actually I should put another slide in here that says, jump to Zojo for demos. So let's just do that now. All right, I just gotta see if I can shrink this window. Looks like I can't. All right, so here we have just a simple project that is gonna show some uh, array stuff. And I'll have all these projects available when the video goes online the next day or so, uh, hopefully within the day, but. Uh, So the first thing I want to do here is just uncomment that so you can see the example of a runtime exception. So let's just run this. All right, so we're here in the debugger. And we step through the code. So you can see I just declared usernames here as an array. I set its upper bound 
to 10, which means it has 11 elements. So if we come on here in the debugger, we can see how it's specified. I can click on it and I can see all 11 elements. If the values are specified, I could see the values here as well. This creates one that has no entries. And you can see that it shows up right here. It has a minus one in there to indicate it's blank. If I click on it, you can see there's nothing there. Now, if I try to access the fifth position of the names, I'm going to get an out-of-bounds exception because as we just saw, there's nothing in there. So I get the little bug icon, an exception now appears here. It says out-of-bounds exception. No real specifics because that's just a uh, general exception there. And that's the end of that. Uh, your app needs to stop. So that's the sort of uh, thing you have to pay attention for. Uh, let's comment that out so we can continue through the code. All right, so the append method is going to add one row to the end of our blank array. So now you see here it now says zero is the upper bound and there's one entry. I can populate an array with a bunch of values all at once. So we can see here this will populate the first names item. And you can see I declared it with no size, and it's just going to get the size of however many values I stick in there. So you can see there's five values. So that sets the upper bound to four, zero through four. You can sort it just by calling the sort method. And if we look at first names now, we'll see that it's actually in sorted order. We can look for a particular one. So if I want to find Ben in that array, I can use the index of method. And you can see here uh, the position is, oh, I sorted it first before. So my comment is wrong. I'll update the comment. That was the original position. So now you can see it's at position one. I can just shuffle it, and that puts everything in random order. It'll randomize it each time you call shuffle. I can add something else to the end. You can see the size went up, and now Paul is now at the end of the array. I can put it into text, so we can see all names here now has the array content separated by a comma and a space, which is a delimiter I put in here. And I now have that uh, useful for when you need to display array contents, uh, probably its primary use. And of course you can go in the reverse order and create an array from the string that has a nice delimiter. So we can see here new names now has the values that were in the string all nice in an array. And the same delimiter we use is the comma and the space. And this can be useful for processing uh, files that are tab delimited, probably one of its primary uses. Now there's two ways you can iterate through an array. Uh, the, the traditional way is to use the for loop and you can do it using a counter variable. So here you can see I have four i as integer, start at zero, go up to the upper bound. And then I can just loop through each one and you can see the name will get assigned each time through to each person that's in the array. Or you can use the for each. And if you haven't used this before, it's pretty slick. You can see it's a little bit simpler. Uh, so I say for each, I declare the variable n as text uh, that has to match the type of the array and then I say in the array, and then each time through the loop, n will have the name. So I just put this here as kind of a placeholder for the debugger to step through, but you can see n is now Bob, and then each time through, it's gonna just get assigned. So you can see how the n just changes. So this is a little simpler because you don't need to maintain the counter variable. You don't have to then do the lookup into the array to get the actual value from the array. Uh, its downside though is it, doesn't have a counter variable. Sometimes you do want to know that actual index. Uh, you might use it for something. Uh, in which case, doing it the first way with the, using the U-bound would be the way to loop through it. Uh, the other reason uh, you may uh, sometimes want to stick with uh, uh, doing it this top way is to ensure that you get the specific order you want. 
for each is a nice convenience, but there's no guarantee that it's going to return things in any specific order. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if the order is terribly important to you. All right, let's quit this and take a look at the class example here. So this, we'll just uh, step through this, but I wanted to un comment again, these lines that are going to raise an exception. This is gonna show you just how you could use a customer with an array, which is uh, handy. So a customer is just a class that I have here uh, on the uh, project, and it just has two properties, city and last name, nothing complex for this example. So I just here, I'm gonna create an array that contains two customers, two rows, two elements, and you can see they initially are starting as nil. And this is an important concept uh, when you're dealing with, uh, when you're dealing with classes, uh, because, you know, there's no instance yet. I just, I created an array, but it's the same as if you created a variable of type customer. If you don't create an instance using the new keyword, it's nil. And the same thing applies to the array. So if I just here try to set C to be customers one, well, that's going to work. And C is going to get nil because that's what customer one is. It's nil. But if you don't think that through, you might think, all right, well, now I'm just going to set C's last name value. But you can't do that because C is nil. And that's when you get the everyone's favorite nil object exception. So you have to set up your instances and get them into the array before you can actually use them. The same as with you know, any variable or anything else. But it's, it's a little subtle, and sometimes people miss that. So here I'm creating a new actual instance. I'm setting its last name. And then I can assign it to a position in the array. And you can see that one now has an actual value. And if I click on it, I can see what it is. I'll add a second one here. And I stuck that in the first position. So now you can see there's two customers in here, uh, Mr. Zane or Mrs. Zane and the Smith. So now, how, what if you wanted to sort these customer things by their last name? Well, you can't just call sort on this because it's not a simple type. And this is where you can use the sort, sort with method to sort it for you. And the way to do this is you kind of create a new array that contains the values of the class that you want to actually use for sorting purposes. So in this particular class, if I want to sort by last name, I'd create a new array and copy into it the last names from each of the classes in the array. And that's what this code is doing here. It's creating a new array called sort names. And then I'm looping through each of the classes in our customer array. And I'm adding it to the sort names array. And I'll just get two entries here in sort names. And you can see it's the two uh, last names from the class. Now, the magic is done using the sort with method. So I tell it I want to sort our simple array here. And with it, I want to also sort the customers array. This is the one that contains the classes. So it's going to sort the first array, which has the simple text names. And anytime any of those get moved around, it'll move along with it the customer array position. So the end result is that you have sort names that is now sorted, Smith and Zane, but that's not the one you really care about. You now have customer that is now sorted with Smith is now first, and oops, I went out too far, and Zane is now second. So that's how you can sort a, uh, a class any, any way you want. Uh, it's pretty fast and easy, and it does have the extra step of having to loop through your class array and extracting out the value you want to sort on. But once you do that, it's uh, fast and easy. All right, got a question here from Edwin. 
are the variables used in a for each loop by ref? Uh, hang on, I gotta slide this so I can read the whole question. Uh, will the change of that value change the value of the array item? No, uh, they changing the value of, uh, I don't have it on this one, but if you look at the other code here, if you change the value of N here, this does not change the value that's uh, in the array. Uh, essentially the value from the array was assigned uh, to N. So, uh, it's not going to modify that, at least for the simple types. I mean, of course, if you're dealing with classes or whatnot, they're going to be references, and you have to keep that in mind. But for the simple types, it's a it's just a, a new variable containing that. All right, so that is arrays. Some simple examples. Let's take a look at dictionary. Now here's one example of how you could use dictionary. There's a, probably a, a bajillion, and uh, I commonly use them with database type stuff. But here is a list of the months, and I'm using the month name as the key. And the value for each month is the actual number of days that's in the month. And I just have this set up how you might expect. So you can see here I have a key. This is a text key, but an integer uh, value. And I can just iterate through the dictionary, like you see here. Uh, and you'll notice it's a dictionary, uh, how, this example of how to use dictionary entry. Uh, whenever you're iterating through a dictionary, you get back a dictionary entry. So I'm saying days as dictionary entry in, and then you specify the dictionary name in months. And then here I can assign uh, the specific thing. So I can put the number of days, that's the value here on the right hand side, so I can assign that here. And then the key is what's here, and that is just text. And then I can just dis display that. So you can see when you run through here, uh, the end result will just be all of those things being displayed. And you can see as I'm doing this, the order, again, February here, and then January, and the order is not matching the order they were put into the dictionary in any way. And that should be okay because dictionaries aren't meant to really be ordered. You're just meant to have stuff that's in there in a mechanism you can look up using keys. So uh, again, if the order is particularly important, uh, an array might make more sense for storing your information. All right, uh, similar type thing to that is this uh, URL example here. I have two items. The keys are uh, names of the bookmark, essentially, and then the value is an actual URL. And what we're going to do here is going to create a dictionary of some particular things, and then we're going to loop through them, and we're going to add them to a list box. And I'm also going to add a couple, as I said here, fake bookmarks that aren't going to have a uh, they're not actually going to be in the dictionary. These are just going to get added to the list box. And when we click on items in the list box, we get the name of what was clicked. We make sure our dictionary is not empty. But if you try to fetch a key from the dictionary that is not in there, you're going to get the exception, the key not found exception. So we'll see what that looks like here. So I click that to populate it. So if I click one of the ones that is, uh, you know, has an actual value, you can see that it shows up here in the little uh, URL viewer. But news and sports don't have values. So if I click those, jump into the debugger here, and I've got a key not found exception. And you can see looking here, it's telling me news is a key that is not found in our dictionary. So much sadness, uh, and now the bug in my app. So there's several ways you can fix this, and I note uh, here in the comment, and I talked about has key, so I could just do if uh, the name of our dictionary, 
And then I could do it like this. Actually, I probably want to put the load URL within the if statement there. So this particular thing will check if the key exists, and if it does, it will get its value and then attempt to load it. If the key doesn't exist, well, it's not going to do anything. That might be okay for the behavior you want. And you can see if we run that. Now they just don't do anything. That's better than crashing. Alternatively, you could use the uh, lookup method. And that we would end up essentially replacing the, uh, do I want to do that one before the try catch? Actually, I'll just show you the try catch first. So lookup would change that a little bit. You can do a try catch. So, you know, I could do try catch key as uh, key not found exception. And then this code will attempt to run. If the exception is raised, it'll jump to the, the catch section. And then you can do what you want here, which is, you know, do nothing or, or whatever. It's much speedier to not do it this way when you have methods that are available to you. Um, and it also makes debugging a bit easier because uh, even if you the doing the uh, nothing route makes sense, you're still going to drop into the debugger if you have break on exceptions enabled up here, which uh, most people probably do. And then you'll have to hit continue to, to go past that. So if you don't have to, you don't want to really rely on that, this particular technique here. So the last method is lookup. And I can say, all right, look up the key and get its value. But if the value is not available because the key doesn't exist, well, don't raise an exception. Just use this as the default value. So this should mean if I click any of those fake ones at the end, it should just go to the Zojo homepage. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see that's how you can uh, manage the items in your dictionary. And again, each one has their own specific techniques. So you, uh, you're going to have to pick the one that works for you. You could certainly use has key to cover all these situations. Um, lookup is just probably a bit more concise way of uh, doing a, a value fetch and checking if the key exists in one way. Has key just is a Boolean, so you can have more complicated conditionals if the key doesn't exist. All right, the next thing to look at is case sensitivity here in the dictionary. And the way I'm going to show you how to implement this is by creating a subclass. So what I did here is I created a case sensitive dictionary. And you can see here it is case sensitive dictionary. And I set it super to zojo.core.dictionary. All right, before I dig into this too deep, I got a, question, a couple of questions I just want to scan. Uh, Edwin is noting lookup would be better. Right, this is a great example of how uh, the use of lookup would work. Uh, I put in there for my lookup that, hey, if, just go to the, uh, the Zojo homepage. But Edwin's saying, well, you could just, you know, head over to Google search and send it uh, the search query as your keyword and you get back a list of pages that might be useful. So yeah, it's, that's, that's more of an imp implementation detail, but a, a good example of how these commands can be used in your apps. All right, going back to this. So I've got a subclass here, and it's super is zojo.core.dictionary. That allows me to implement the compare keys event handler. And you can see, you know, it passes in a couple parameters. It has a return value. And it passes in uh, LHS is left-hand side, and RHS is the right-hand side. And then you just have to compare them however you want to compare them. Uh, in our case, we're just going to have text. That's easy. So I'm just going to use the compare method 
of the two values of the text, uh, the compare method on text to compare the two values, and I'm going to supply the case sensitive option. And I'll, and this already happens to return a value that uh, will match how compare keys works, and that is zero if they're equal, and I forget the specific order, but it'll return a positive number one if one is greater than the other, and a negative number minus one if one is less than. But this in, ensures the case sensitive comparison. And you can see here in the code, which we'll run in a moment, we're going to do an example so you can see the difference. Uh, we'll do the first with a regular dictionary that's not modified in any way. And we'll set uh, two values with two different, what looks like two different keys, but normally these are not case sensitive. And then we'll use the case sensitive dictionary. And because this one is not case sensitive, you know, what do you think is going to happen here? Well, Test here is going to get set to this particular value. And then test here is going to get set to this value. But these are actually going to refer to the same item in the dictionary. So essentially, this is going to replace the first value. So when I go to retrieve these two things here, I'm not actually retrieving two different values. I'm retrieving the same value twice. But in this one here, it is actually going to be two different values. All right, so we've populated our dictionary. And if you see, if I click on it, you can see, yeah, it only has one value. Count is one. And it's getting back text for test. It's getting the second one, even though, you know, we asked for the, the lowercase one, but case is not mattering here, and, and it's not changing. So there's only one value, and that's what we're getting each time. But when we use the case-sensitive dictionary, we can now see it has two items in here. And I can request them. So if I want the lowercase one, I'm now getting it. If I want uppercase one, I'm now getting it. So very easy, easy way to implement case sensitive dictionaries, which really did not have an easy way at all to do in the old framework. Uh, people would go through all kinds of rigmarole to kind of work around this thing. And, uh, but here, you know, it only took a subclass and just a handful of lines of code and then boom, case sensitive dictionary. All right. The next and last thing we want to look at today are the iterators. I got two examples for that. So the first one is what I call the iterable list box. So this here, we have a list box with some values in here. And as everyone knows, I always use baseball stuff for sample data. So we got our list box with some values. We want to iterate through the values. So if we look at the code here, this is the code because of the way I'll have implemented things. I can write this code for each row as text in our baseball team list box, display each one. Now, normally you can't do that. So how is that working? Well, you're going to need to have two things. You have to implement the iterable interface, and you have to implement the iterator interface. Both of these, if you're going to implement them, are going to need their own classes, of course. Now, in my case here, I created an iterable list box. It's a subclass of list box. And I also have specified on it that it is iterable. This is the interface. And I said I want it to be iterable. By doing that, that adds automatically for you this get iterator method that you have to implement. And all you need to do in this method is set up your iterator. So in my particular case, I'm creating a new iterator, which I'm calling listbox iterator. I'm passing into it in its constructor, uh, the list box itself. That way I'll have access to all its data. And then I just return. So this is uh, just to set up, this is the easy part. 
The real work is in Listbox Iterator. So you can see it has a constructor. It doesn't do, again, do anything uh, terribly sophisticated. It's just taking uh, the list box and assigning it to a property so we can use it throughout our class. And it's setting the initial count of uh, the, the list box data that was assigned. And this is so that we can uh, verify things as we're using it, because there, generally there are restrictions on for each. And one of the big ones is that you don't want the data you're for each looping through to be modified while you're looping through it. That can cause bad, bad juju, things like infinite loops. So you don't want that to happen. So you want to be checking for that. And if that situation occurs, uh, you're going to want your iterator to raise an exception, which is what we're going to do here. So the constructor is, uh, is just setting that stuff up. And if we look at listbox iterator, you can see it's just a simple class, but it does have an interface specified on it. And it has the iterator interface selected. That gives you the two methods you see here, move next and value. The move next method is how you want to uh, essentially move the pointer through your data. So uh, skipping the validation check, we're just checking here. Uh, if our iterator row is still within the bounds of the list box, we just increase it. Now it's important to note that when the iterator first starts, it's not pointing at anything. So uh, you have to call uh, the move next will be called once to essentially start you at the beginning of the list. So you, you don't want your uh, iterator to assume it's starting at the beginning of the list. You want it to assume it's not pointing at anything just yet. When there are no more rows, it just returns false. And then here it's doing a valid check and it's calling the computed property to check if uh, the iterator is still valid. And the computed property is, whoops, is the get, is just simply making sure that the number of rows in the list box hasn't changed. Now, what this validation check has to be depends entirely on you and how you're implementing things. I just put a simple one here that says, all right, I think we're safe as long as the row count in the list box is not getting modified. If it is getting modified while we're looping, you know, it may be that we never reach the end of the list. You could get an infinite loop. Those are always awful. And if the list size does change, we're just going to rate, we're going to create a new uh, zojo.core iterator exception. I'm going to add a little bit extra info to the reason here, and then I'm just going to raise it. And that will cause the, uh, the exception to appear in your app. So that's it for the setup. It's, uh, it's pretty simple to set up, really. I mean, there's, there's a few properties here, but they're not doing a heck of a lot. And there's, you know, there's only two real methods. The value method is just called to uh, return the data that you want to be available. And man, why does Adobe Flash Player always pop up during the webinars? The, so, and again, because you have control over this, you can return the data however you want. I mean, we have a list box here, so what do we want to return for data? Well, I have it set up here to just, uh, return all, uh, what am I doing here? I guess I'm just uh, displaying all the cells that are in the row kind of together, separated by spaces. And I only have two, uh, two, uh, two columns. So let's just run this so you can see the end result. So the end result is it's just gonna do what you would expect with the for each loop. It's just looping through each one. And you can see it's returning the combination here because that's what I wanted. I could have just returned one column or two columns or whatever I wanted. I could have returned an array that had each of the uh, columns in it for the row, whatever I thought was appropriate for whatever I'm building. And this here is an example of how you can crash uh, the iterator. And why did that crash? Well, let's look at the code here. Uh, you can see I'm doing the same for each, but in the middle, I've changed the size of the list box. I've added a row to it. And that, based on how we implemented our iterator, is a failure condition. That no longer makes, uh, essentially, the iterator valid. We've changed, this, changed its size. So my code is returning the, uh, the exception. And you can see, if we go back here, 
you can see the uh, exception right here. And you can see in the reason that our reason is filled in. All right, well, before we move to our last example, which is another iterator, uh, Edwin is asking, going back to dictionaries, uh, he's asking about a bin count property in the old dictionary. Well, I'm not here to talk about the old dictionary, so I may not answer that. But uh, as you might notice, it's not on the new dictionary, which would kind of tell you that it wasn't really necessary. That was kind of a low-level implementation detail that kind of allowed you to control the hash, how the hashing worked. And there's no real reason that, that would ever need to be modified. So uh, we no longer expose that. All right, let's look at the last project here. Uh, this one is an iterable text class. And this essentially allows you to do a for each over text. Now you might be thinking, well, how would I do that? Uh, well, you, you do that however you want. Uh, in my particular case, I've implemented it this way as uh, line by line of the text. And then that's kind of neat. So here it's just gonna loop through each text line by line and display it in the message box. So if I, this is just a giant text area, I can type stuff and you can see it's just doing a neat loop going through it line by line, which again is not something you normally can do with just general text doing that line by line. So to do that, again, you need two classes. Now, since we're not subclassing a UI element, uh, I've created two here. So I have my iterable text and you can see it, you know, it just is going to be set up the same way. It's set up as iterable. It just has a constructor on here to pass in the text that you want to make iterable and creates the actual iterator, which is a text iterator. And again, it's passing the text along to it. And the hard work is done in text iterator. Uh, the constructor just gets the text. And the big thing it's doing though is it's assigning it to the text computed property. And this is just uh, splitting the text based on uh, the end of the line character and then saving that out into a property. And then the move next is essentially just, you know, checking which line you are at and updating it each time through. Uh, you know, essentially there's just an array that's behind the scenes here that's being uh, parsed. And and then the value is just returning the particular position in our array that we've already split out. And of course, you know, all this code, it's not like any of this is 100% necessary. You could always do this your own way with your own code in the method. But having this all abstracted away out into this, you don't need to keep track of this code or manage it anymore. It's not all now in one separate place, maybe in a framework or something that you use regularly. And then you can just use it like this. So it simplifies hopefully the code you might have to write repeatedly. So now I'm just creating a new iterable text class. I'm just uh, populating it with some initial text. In this case, what happens to be in my text area. And then I can just call this to loop through it. I don't have to have special code in here that say, well, just get the text, just do the split on it into an array and then just iterate through the array. Uh, not only that's a lot longer to work with, but again, these are simple examples. Uh, but it does, it just hides all that code. So if you do need to change that implementation later, uh, it's all in its own place. And then the rest of your app can just take advantage of it. If you, if you change how it works or you add improvements to it or whatnot. All right. Well, this was the last, uh, iterator example. Uh, I'll scan the questions here in a moment. I want to remind everyone that I will have all these examples and the slides and the video, uh, uploaded later this afternoon or certainly tomorrow. So be sure to, if you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube site or uh, head on over to the video section of the Dev Center, which I will show you in a moment to uh, see when it's posted. Edwin is asking, uh, he's never seen that little shortcut thing I did here, the ampersand UD 
And where was that? That was down here. Ampersand uh, U just stands for uh, uh, Unicode value, and D is uh, the hex value for, I think, a line feed in this case. Uh, that's been around for a while. I, I don't specifically know when that was added to Zojo, but uh, it's been around for a while. So you can use that in place of uh, text literals. Uh, and it can be pretty handy, uh, obviously, in cases like this. All right, so let's switch over here to Safari. So looking at the Dev Center here, um, you have, of course, the full reference guide section of all new framework items and language commands. Uh, We're in the process of adding uh, classic framework stuff here. It'll mostly be links to what you see in the wiki. But it uh, will be searchable in one place to be able to search here and find stuff once everything's in place. Uh, the video section is where you can track all the videos. Uh, the about webinar section will have the archive. So when this video is available, it will show up here under the date with a link. They're also categorized on the main video page for you to scan through and here in the navigator. And of course, everything is always searchable. So. If I looking for the Zojo Wars webinar that I'm sure all of you are diligently working on your ship for the battle next month, you can just type that here in the search field and it comes up. And a uh, dictionary comes up here. Uh, and of course, I'll add these sort of things to keywords to the videos. So when they're added, uh, they will show up as well. So it should improve the ability for people to search and find things, uh, hopefully, starting to get all that into one place to make it easier for people to find what they're looking for. All right, well, I think I covered everything I wanted to cover today, even with the late start. Oh, well, we did finish a little late too, so it took about as long as I expected. Our next webinar is scheduled for June, no, July. Uh, forget the exact date, but first or second week of July. So stay tuned for that. Edwin is asking if I've received any Zojo Wars ships yet. Uh, and ships are not due until July 7th, if I remember. So no, I haven't received any yet. Uh, usually I get those at the last minute if, the, uh, if what happened at XCC is any uh, indication of how. Well, we all know, let's face the truth, us programmers, we're procrastinators. So I expect to get a bunch of ships hours before the deadline, but the more the merrier. If you want tips on how to make your ships, be sure to watch the webinar on Zojo Wars. All right, I want to thank everyone for attending. Have a great day.